Hi, this is part 5 of Company Low Problems and Solutions. The topic we are going to discuss is Prospectus. So, the first problem. A applied for certain shares of a company on the basis of a prospectus containing the names of the directors. Some of the directors retired before the shares could be allotted. Can A set aside the contract? The solution. Yes, if a statement becomes untrue when the allotment is made, uh, with a statement in the prospectus becomes untrue, when allotment is made, the contract can be rescinded. Now, next problem. A, deci a deceitful prospectus containing an untrue statement was issued by the defendant on behalf of a company. The plaintiff received a copy of it but did not take any shares originally in the company. The allotment was completed and after several months, the plaintiff bought 200 shares in the open market. The plaintiff sues the defendant for rescission on the ground of untrue statement in the prospectus, besides stating reasons. In this case, the plaintiff cannot succeed. The effect of the prospectus uh, is exhausted as soon as an allotment is made. Moreover, he is not the original allottee. So, here the plaintiff cannot succeed. Now, another problem. A public company has issued a prospectus, but the subscription list has not opened as yet. The company received a letter from a prospective buyer of the company's shares requesting it to furnish him certain particulars which are not mentioned in the prospectus. How should the secretary of the company deal with the request? Here, prospectus has been issued. Furnishing additional information only to selected persons may amount to discrimination. The secretary is advised not to furnish additional information till closing of the subscription list. Now, another problem. That is... A prospectus contained a material false statement. Mr. P purchased the shares in the company in good faith on the stock exchanges, relying on that statement. The company was wound up. Wound up. Mr. P's name was put in the list of contributors. Is P liable to pay? He wants to sue the director to recover damages for misstatement. Advise him. Here, A, a purchaser of share in the open market, has no remedy for misstatement in the prospectus. Once again, a purchaser of share in the open market has no remedy for misstatement in the prospectus. Hence, Mr. P is liable to the company. He cannot recover damages from the directors. Now, misleading prospectus. According to section 34, subclause 1, a statement included in the prospectus shall be deemed to be untrue if two conditions, that is one, if the statement is misleading in the form and context in which it is included, or where any inclusion or omission from a prospectus of any matter is likely to be misled. Now, a contract of shares in a company is an obirime fide, that is, outmost good faith contract. So, a contract of shares in a company is obirime fide, that is, outmost good faith contract. The intending purchaser of shares are entitled to true and correct disclosure of all the facts in the prospectus. Neither any information nor which the, uh, which the law requires to be disclosed to the public be concealed or omitted to be stated from the prospectus, nor should the information give, given be false and misleading. A prospectus must make all the statements with the scrupulous accuracy and not state facts which are not strictly correct. A statement may be false not only because of what it states, but also because of what it conceals, omits or implies. Suppression of facts will be as bad as disclosure of wrong facts. In Rex vs. Kleisent, Rex vs. Kleisent, 1932. In this case, the prospectus of a company, it was stated that the company had regularly paid dividends during the last year, last several years, when the company had actually been incurring substantial losses during all these years. The company had converted its losses into profits by writing back some of the past provisions to the credit of the profit and loss account. It was held that the prospectus did not disclose the true picture of the company. The prospectus was false and misleading. The statement though true in itself, was rendered false in the context in which it was stated. The court observed, truth, whole truth and nothing but the truth must be disclosed. 
half truth is no better than a downright falsehood so that was held in rex versus clyson that is 1932 case now another problem we have here is a company issued a prospectus advertising that the company has a great potential turnover of a million bags of cement in a year it is discovered later that the while the company did have the installed capacity of 1 million bags it has never produced more than 6 lakh bags of cement in a year buyers of the shares seek remedy against the misleading statement will they succeed so the solution no for any prospectus to be termed misleading there should be a misstatement of a material fact it should be distinguished from the statement of a promise or opinion so in this uh, instant case it was said as potential turnover so the company did have a capacity installed capacity to produce uh, 1 million bags just that it produced more or just more than 6 lakh bags in a year but it did have installed capacity and thus had potential turnover so for any prospectus to be termed misleading there should be a misstatement of a material fact it should be distinguished from a statement of a promise or opinion here potential turnover is a promise or opinion now the next problem all statements in a prospectus issued by a public limited company were literally true but it failed to disclose that dividends stated in it as paid were not paid out of a realized profit the statement that the company had paid dividends for a number of years was true but the fact that the company had incurred losses for all these years was not disclosed in the prospectus an allotty of shares wanted to avoid the contract on the ground that the prospectus did not close the, uh, disclose this fact which in his opinion was very material will he succeed give reasons here the solution is that he will succeed concealment of a material fact makes the prospectus misleading thus he will succeed and he can avoid the contract now the next problem bogo limited issued a prospectus which contained some misleading statements mr yogi knowing the fact did not subscribe to the issue but he purchased some shares from the open market and claimed compensation from the company on the ground that the prospectus issued for the shares contained misleading statements can he succeed give reasons so we already discussed earlier a purchaser of share in the open market has no remedy for misleading statement in the prospectus now we have a case law peak versus gurney 1873 peak versus gurney no here the answer is no as he is not an original allotee of shares a person who had not purchased the shares on the basic basis of the prospectus which contained false and misleading statements shall not be entitled to any remedy either that of rescinding the contract or that of claiming the damages a man cannot be saved said to have purchased on the basis of prospectus when he has purchased those shares from an existing shareholder similarly a purchaser of shares from the share market cannot be looked upon as one to whom the prospectus is addressed and is precluded from bringing an action of deceit because the object of a prospectus is to invite persons to become allottees and the allotment having been completed such object is such object is exhausted and the liabilities to the allottees do not follow the shares into the hands of subsequent transferees directors cannot be made liable infinitum for all subsequent dealings which may takes place with regard to those shares upon the stock exchange so this was uh, held in peak versus gurney the leading it is one of the leading case peak versus gurney here gurney issued a fraudulent prospectus on behalf of a company no shares were purchased by peak at that time several months afterwards peak purchased 2000 shares of the company from the stock exchange he brought an action against the director for deceit here the court held that the directors were not uh, uh, liable because he was not a direct allotee he purchased it from a open market so he did not purchase on the base of the prospectus the uh, liability with respect to the prospectus ends with the closing of the allotment with respect to that prospectus so the next problem amit purchased from bimal 10 lakh shares of xyz limited on the basis of prospectus containing wrong statement 
that is amit purchased from bimal okay and what remedies are available to amit against the company so the same case law peak versus gurney is applicable here since amit did not buy the shares on the basis of the prospectus he has no remedy against the company amit has bought the uh, shares not directly from the company not based on the prospectus but he bought it from another shareholder another person who bought the shares from that it's a subsequent transfer so amit have no remedy against the company now the next problem a prospectus issued by a company contained a promise of subscription of a substantial amount by some person asked to induce the public to subscribe the plaintiff who was allotted 10 shares alleged material misrepresentation decide section 35 sub clause 1 of companies act is applicable here section 35 sub clause 1 provides that where a person has subscribed for securities of a company acting on any statement included or the inclusion or omission of any matter in the prospectus which is misleading and has sustained any loss or damage as a consequence thereof the company and every person who a is a director of the company at the time of the issue of the prospectus b has authorized himself to be named and is named in the prospectus as a director of the company or has agreed to become such director either immediately or after an interval of time c is a promoter of the company d has authorized the issue of the prospectus and e is an expert referred to in subsection 5 of section 26 subsection 5 of section 26 shall without prejudice to any punishment to which any per, uh, person may be liable under section 36 be liable to pay compensation to every person who has sustained such loss or damage so with respect to 35 sub clause 1 we have uh, five categories of people the first one is a director of the company at the time of the issue of the prospectus the second one is a person who is authorized himself to be named and is named in the prospectus as a director of the company or has agreed to become such director either immediately or after the in an interval of time then the third category who is a promoter of the company the fourth one a person who has authorized the issue of the prospectus and the fifth one an expert referred to under section 26 sub clause 5 though these people without shall without prejudice to any punishment to which any person may be liable so without pre prejudice to the punishment they are liable under section 36 these persons will be liable to pay compensation to every person who has sustained such loss or damage so what is the case here a prospectus issued by a company contained a promise of subscription of a substantial amount by some person so as to induce the public to subscribe so this was a misrepresentation material uh, misrepresentation so the relevant section is section 35 sub clause 1 and uh, it says that without prejudice to any punishment to which any person may be liable under section 36 the persons are uh, discussed here they will be liable to com pay compensation to every person who has sustained such loss or damage now the next problem we have here all statements in a prospectus issued by xn company limited were literally true but it failed to disclose that the dividends stated in it in it as paid were not paid out of trading profits but out of realized capital profits the statement that the company had paid dividends for a number of years was true but the company had incurred losses for all those years however no disclosure of this was made in the prospectus an allotee of share wanted to avoid the contract on the ground that the prospectus did not disclose this fact which in his opinion was very material would he succeed so we already discussed this and the relevant case law is rex versus clisent uh, or clisent Yeah, yes concealment of material fact is fraudulent the prospectus accordingly can be described as containing misstatement as to the material facts now another problem we have is an allotee of shares in the company has brought an action against director q in the company in respect of the false statement in the prospectus the director has contended that the statement was prepared by promoters and he had relied on them is the director liable under the circumstance so here yes the director shall be held liable 
a director can escape liability for misstatement in a prospectus only on grounds specified under section 35 sub clause 2 so we already discussed the liability of the uh, five classes of people that is under section 35 sub clause 1 so here the director is liable he can escape the liability only if uh, on the basis of the grounds specified under section 35 sub clause 2 relying on statements prepared by promoters is not a ground included there under accordingly no defense shall be available to the director then we have another problem that is a company issued a prospectus advertising that the company has a great potential turnover of a million bags of cement in a year it is this okay this question we already discussed earlier and here we have uh, we already discussed this question uh, with respect to what is a promise that we uh, we should distinguish between a promise or an opinion and uh, the the factory did have a potential uh, capacity to produce 1 million cement bags but it did produce only 6 lakh uh, cement bags in a year but it had the capacity so this was a promise or an opinion and the case law you can apply here is progressive aluminium limited versus registrar of companies 1997 progressive aluminium limited versus the registrar of the companies 1997 so here what it said in this case uh, what it the court held word held was this is not a misstatement but this is a promise or an opinion so you should uh, distinguish between the misstatement and promise or opinion with respect to prospectus claiming experience of the promoters as the experience of the company was held as not a misrepresentation so in progressive aluminium limited versus registrar of companies the court held that claiming of experience of the promoters as the experience of the company was held as not a misrepresentation and the next question we have is a purchased from b thousand shares of a company on the basis of the prospectus containing wrong statement what remedies available to A against the company? So we did discuss this scenario in many questions. That is, here A is not a direct buyer of the share. Uh, it's a sub. Uh, he is a, trans a subsequent transferee. The directors cannot be held liable infinitum. And here A shall have no remedy against the company because he did not buy the shares based on the uh, directly based on the prospectus. He is not one of the direct LOT. So he has no remedy against the company. And we discussed some case laws with respect to that. Uh, that is, yeah, Peak versus Gurney. So the relevant case law you can discuss with respect to this, uh, where a person is not a direct LOT, is Peak versus Gurney. Now, so the, what you can, the case law you can use when there is a, indirect LOT scenario is peak versus Gurney and when there is a misstatement or misleading statement in the prospectus you can use Rex versus Clisent and in case of uh, an expert opinion uh, in the prospectus if there was an opinion or a, a promise you can uh, discuss the case law progressive aluminum limited versus registrar of companies so the so the next question Directors of a company issued letter of offer inviting shareholders to subscribe to a rights issue. One of the shareholders subscribed 200 shares offered to him by the company and immediately thereafter also purchased 300 shares through stock market. Subsequently, he sued the company alleging that the statement in the letter of offer was misleading and claimed damage for the entire 500 shares recently subscribed and purchased by him. Will he succeed? Support your answer with case law. So again, we can uh, use uh, Peak versus Gurney here. The person had an offer of uh, let letter of offer inviting only for 200 shares. So in this given problem, the shareholder cannot have a claim for the damage in respect of 300 shares purchased from the stock market. He can claim damages only for 200 shares. The relevant case law that can be used is Peak versus Gurney. So once again, when there is a Scenario of original allotment, the, uh, the case law is Peak versus Gurney. And when there is a, a scenario of an promise or opinion, the case law that can be used is Progressive Aluminium Limited versus Registrar of Companies. And when there is a scenario of uh, misstatement in the prospectus, 
the case you can uh, case law can be used as Rex versus Clisent. So the next topic is of shifting of the registered office. So, uh, shifting of a registered office outside the local limits of any city, town or village where such office is situated requires passing of special resolution by the company and notice of the change shall be given to the registrar within 15 days of the change who shall record the same. So, shifting of the registered office outside the local limit of any city, town or village. In such case, there should be a special resolution and the change shall be notified to the registrar within 15 days. Now, the second scenario is shifting of registered office within the same state uh, from the jurisdiction of one registrar of companies to the jurisdiction of another registrar of companies. That requires special resolution by the company and confirmation by the regional director on an application made by the company in this regard. Now, the shifting of registered office shall not be allowed if any inquiry, inspection or investigation has been initiated against the company or any prosecution is pending against the company under the Act. Now, we discussed where the shifting of registered office is within the, uh, outside the local limit and then we discussed about uh, within the state but uh, with, uh, outside the jurisdiction of one registrar to uh, the jurisdiction of another registrar. So, in both these cases, there should be special resolution if uh, the registered office is being shifted within the jurisdiction of the same registrar, the registrar shall be given a notice uh, within 15 days after the change is made and the change can be made only by special resolution. But even after special resolution, the change uh, shifting change is from the jurisdiction of one registrar to the jurisdiction of another registrar within the same state then uh, the uh, there should be a confirmation by the regional director on an application made by the company in this regard. So, shifting jurisdiction between registers, two different registers within the same company, not only special resolution is uh, needed, we also need confirmation from the regional director on an application made, made by the company in this regard. And now, if we are to shift the register office from one state to another state, the alteration of the memorandum relating to the place of the registered office from the state to another request, section 13 subclause 2 requirements. Here, section 13 subclause 2 requirements, that is, first one, passing the special resolution, and the second one, approval from the central government. A certified copy of the order of the central government approving the alteration shall be filed by the company with the registrar of each of the state within such time and in such manner as may be prescribed who shall register the same and the registrar of the state where the registered office is being shifted to shall issue a fresh certificate of incorporation indicating the alteration. So shifting of the registered office, three scenarios. One is within the jurisdiction of the same registrar but outside the local limit of the city or village or taluk. In that case, they need to take a special uh, resolution and they need to give a notice to the registrar within 15 days from the uh, passing of special resolution. Now, the second scenario, within the same state, but uh, the jurisdiction of one registrar is, uh, the registered office is shifted from the jurisdiction of one registrar to the jurisdiction of another register, registrar. In that case, along with the uh, special resolution, you need to get a confirmation from the regional director and the confirmation can be obtained only or based on the application that the company makes to the regional director on this regard. And the third scenario, when the, uh, the registered office is shifted from one state to another state. So, the first requirement, here section 13 subclause 2 is applicable. The first requirement is again special resolution, but along with it, uh, we should, it should be approved by the central government and the order of the central government should be uh, along with the other documents should be sent to the registrars of both the state and the uh, the registrar of the state where the registered office is being shifted to that registrar should issue a new registration certificate or new incorporation certificate based on this order and the documents produced. Now, alteration or change in object clause. So, the uh, problem here is 
the object loss of memorandum of a company empowers it to carry on distillery business and any other business that is allied to it the company wants to alter its memorandum so as to include the cinema business in its object loss advise the company so here the alteration uh, any alteration towards the memorandum of association invokes uh, section 13 and here it's section 13 sub clause 8 Once again, Section Thirteen, Sub Clause Eight. So, alteration or change in object clause. A company which has raised money from public through prospectus still has any uh, and still has any unutilized amount of amount out of the money so raised, shall not change its object for which it raised the money through prospectus unless a special resolution is passed by the company through postal ballot and. the notice in respect of the resolution for altering this object shall contain the following particulars and nine particulars are laid down the first one the total money received the second one the total money utilized for the object stated in the prospectus the third one the unutilized amount out of the money so raised through prospectus the fourth one the particulars of the proposed alteration or change in the objects the fifth one the justification for alteration or change in the objects the sixth one the amount proposed to be utilized for the new objects the seventh one the estimated financial impact of the proposed alteration on the earning and cash flow of the company eighth one the other relevant information which is necessary for the members to take an informed decision on the proposed resolution the ninth one the place from where any interested person may obtain a copy of the notice of resolution to be passed so all these particulars has to be uh, given and such uh, the res special resolution is passed by the company through postal ballot and the notice in respect of the resolution shall have these nine particulars laid down now the details as may be prescribed in the respect of such resolution shall also be published in the newspaper that is one in english and one in vernacular language which is in circulation at the place where the registered office of the company is situated and shall also be placed on the website of the company if any indicating therein the justification for the for such change the dissenting shareholders shall give uh, shall be given an opportunity to exit by the promoters and shareholders having control in accordance with the regulations to be specified by the securities and exchange board of india so the dissenting shareholders shall be given an opportunity to exit by the promoters and shareholders having control in accordance with regulations to be specified by sebi now in case of companies which have not raised money through prospectus objects can be changed any time by passing of special resolution the advertisement shall be published simultaneously with the dispatch of the postal ballot notices to shareholders the registrar shall register the alteration of the memorandum with respect to the objects of the company and certify the registration within a period of 30 days from the date of filing the special resolution so uh, certify the registration within a period of 30 days from the date of filing of special resolution The next problem we have here is the main object of a company is to manufacture cement seeing the potential for new business the board of directors decided to go decided to uh, the board of directors decided to go in for manufacture of steel and steel related products these are included in the object clause of the company can the company undertake the aforesaid new business discuss So once again, the alteration of object clause, section thirteen sub clause eight, is attracted. The most important or invoked, the section thirteen sub clause eight is invoked. The most important clause in the memorandum of association of a company is the object clause. It is the object clause which lays down the objects of the company. A company cannot do anything beyond or outside its objects, and any act done beyond them will be ultra vires and void. a company can exercise only such powers as are either expressly stated therein or as may be necessary in furtherance of its objects according to section 4 sub clause c of the memorandum of association of a company 
uh, according to section 4 sub clause c the memorandum of association of a company must state the object for which the company is proposed to be incorporated and any matter considered necessary in furtherance thereof now another question we have uh, with respect to object clause is the prospectus of a company stated that it is raising a capital of 100 crore rupees for expanding its automobile business board of directors of the company now wants to invest the funds raised for its pharmaceutical business advise the board as to the procedure to uh, to be followed so we already discussed this scenario where the money raised is based on prospectus and where it is not based on prospectus so when it is based on prospectus there should be a, speci a special resolution passed by the company through postal ballot and a notice in respect of the resolution for altering the object shall be uh, sent to all the shareholders and the, this notice shall uh, specify nine particulars which is to the total money received the total money utilized for the object that was stated in the prospectus now what is the rest of the unutilized money that is there and what is the part uh, what is the particulars of the proposed alteration what is the new plan to how to utilize this money and there should be a justification of uh, how this alteration is beneficial for the company as well as the shareholders that is the justification for the alteration or change in the objects now the amount proposed to be utilized so out of the unutilized money uh, what percentage what amount of it is proposed to be used for this new uh, change of object now the estimation uh, estimated financial impact of the proposed alteration on the earnings and cash flow of the company then the other relevant information which is necessary for the members to take an informed decision on the proposed resolution and finally the place from where any interested person may obtain a copy of the notice of resolution to be passed so all this uh, particular should be uh, mentioned or given in the notice and a special resolution shall be passed by passing through the postal uh, by company through postal ballot so that is with respect to uh, change in object close when the money is raised from the prospectus but in case if it was not from the prospectus uh, they could have done it uh, by sp uh, special resolution and uh, and giving an advertisement in the uh, newspaper to with the dispatch of postal ballot notices to shareholders so that is in case where uh, it was uh, the money was not uh, raised from the uh, sec uh, prospectus now next is the name of the company so how does name of the company affect so advice asiatic government society uh, security Asiatic Government Security Life Insurance Company Limited, whether it can seek an injunction against the new Asiatic Insurance Company Limited, which was subsequently formed, restraining it from having in the in its name the word Asiatic on the ground that it has caused confusion and can be can deceive the public. So here we have the case law that Asiatic Asiatic Government Security Life Insurance Company Limited versus New Asiatic insurance company limited so this is a real life case so the court held the two names were not too identical and therefore did not restrain the respondents few words are common may not render the name too identical and thus undesirable the companies act 2013 permits the promoters of a company to choose any suitable name of the company provided the name chosen is not undesirable a name may be considered undesirable where it is too similar to the name of an already existing company in the present problem since the two companies are in insurance business it may lead to a natural inference on the part of the public that the two are interrelated because of the word asiatic which is quite an imaginary word does not mean anything mere addition of the word new is not likely to give an impression that the two companies are different therefore on a suit by asiatic asiatic government security life insurance company limited court is likely to advise the new asiatic asiatic insurance company limited to change its name and remove the word asiatic therefrom in another case law in society of motor manufacturers and traders limited versus motor manufacturers and traders uh, mutual assurance limited so society of motor manufacturers and traders limited versus Motor Manufacturers and Traders Mutual Assurance Limited. The plaintiff company bought an action to restrain the defendant company from using the set name. 
but Lawrence Justice held anyone who took the trouble to think about the matter would see the defendant company was an insurance company and the plaintiff uh, society was a trade protection society and I do not think that the defendant company is liable to have this business stopped unless it changes its names, name supply name simply because a thoughtless person might unwarrantedly jump to the conclusion that it is connected with the plaintiff society. So, in the second case law, the, both the companies were of different sectors. But in the case of uh, Asia, Asiatic, Asiatic Insurance uh, Government Security Life Insur Assurance Company and uh, New Asiatic Insurance Company, the both the companies were in insurance and it was uh, possible that the people may uh, consider both the companies interrelated. Now, the next problem, the Methodist Church in India sought restriction of a company in the name of the Methodist Church in India Trust Association. There was already existing a company bearing the name Methodist Church in Northern India Trust Association Private Limited. In Calcutta, the former in Calcutta, the former secretary of the latter, the former secretary of the latter, that is, uh, the Northern India uh, Methodist Church in Northern India Trust Association Private Limited. So, the former secretary of this trust uh, informed the registrar that the said company had not functioned since 1970, that no annual report or minutes had been filed with the registrar since 1970, and that some directors died and some had left. The question was whether in these circumstances the Calcutta company was barred to the registration of a new company. Here in the solution... We have a case law that is Executive Board of Methodist Church in India versus Union of India. So, this is also a real life case scenario and the case, uh, the case is Executive Board of Methodist Church in India versus Union of India 1985. And the court held that if a company is practically defunct, that is dormant, it is not a bar to registration of a new company with a similar name. So, what the court held here is if the company is practically defunct, it is not a bar to registration of a new company with a similar name. So with that, we are coming to the end of the part 5 of this discussion. And there we still have a lot of questions to discuss. And that will be in the following parts. Stay tuned and thank you for listening.